Hello and welcome. We're returning here to the basic problem of encrypting data in such a way as to provide its privacy, but this time in the public key or asymmetric setting. We'll be leveraging number theory in order to give solutions to this problem. For millennia, people developed cryptography, and yet it always stayed in a symmetric setting. So in the 1970s, the birth of public key cryptography was a revolution. You can read about the story and the characters involved in this book by Stephen Levy. And shown here are some of the inventors, Diffie and Hellman and Rivesh Shamir and Edelman. The black and white pictures are the older ones dating closer to the times of the invention. The colored pictures are more recent. In the symmetric setting that we study, the premise was that before Alice and Bob can communicate securely, they need to have obtained a common secret key. They both know it and the adversary doesn't know it. If Alice wishes then to communicate with someone else, Charlie, then she needs a new fresh key that she shares with Charlie, distinct from the one she shares with Bob. How these keys are communicated to the parties is left out of the symmetric encryption formalizations, but uh, they need to be communicated securely, namely over private and authenticated channels. This in practice can be challenging, and it was these key management and key distribution challenges that motivated people to seek the alternative of public key encryption. In that model, Alice has a secret decryption key that is shared with nobody, so neither Bob nor anyone else knows it. However, the associated to that decryption key is a mathematically related encryption key, EK, and that encryption key is public. It's known not only to Bob, but to anyone who may want to send Alice encrypted data and also to the adversary then anybody can use Alice's encryption key EK to create ciphertext and thereby send encrypted messages to Alice that only she can decrypt. This simplifies the key management and key distribution tasks and is attractive for that reason. As usual, when we start the study of a new primitive, we begin with syntax. The syntax says that if I want to specify a scheme for asymmetric or public key encryption, what do I have to provide? And the answer is three algorithms for key generation, encryption, and decryption that work as follows. Key generation, when it's run, it's randomized, will produce two keys, an encryption key and a matching decryption key. The encryption algorithm takes the encryption key and a message and computes a ciphertext encrypting that message, and this algorithm may be randomized. The decryption algorithm, which is deterministic, takes the decryption key and ciphertext and produces an output that is either a string or the special symbol bot to indicate some kind of failure or, or to properly decrypt. As usual, before we consider security, we want a basic correctness requirement, which simply says that communication is faithfully maintained in the sense that decryption reverses encryption. So here we're asking that for all possible keys that may be output by key generation and for all possible messages, if we encrypt the message to get a ciphertext and decrypt the resulting ciphertext, we do get back the original message. Why is there a probability here? Because the encryption algorithm may be randomized. So this is an event which has some probability, but we're gonna ask that there probably be one, meaning it always happens. The message here is drawn from a message space associated to the scheme. And when we specify schemes, we should indicate what that space is. In a few cases, the space may even depend on the encryption key. The way this would work in practice is that Alice would run key generation locally on her computer to get the encryption and decryption keys. 
There are many algorithms for that provided by systems and software like OpenSSL or SSH keygen. She, she stores in some secure location the decryption key and then provides a way for any prospective sender to obtain her encryption key. So any Bob who wants possibly to send encrypted data to Alice needs to come into possession of this key. Once they have it, however, they can encrypt data under it using the encryption algorithm of the scheme and Alice can decrypt the resulting ciphertext with her decryption key. Now, we move to this setting because of some simplifications and benefits from the point of view of key distribution and management. And one of them is that we no longer require any privacy of the encryption key. But that doesn't mean that we have no requirements on it. We do require authenticity, which means that the sender, when it obtains an encryption key that's supposed to be Alice's, should get some assurance that that's really the case, that it's her key and not someone else's. There are many ways one might arrive at this. We could think of some kind of trusted public place in which keys are posted at, uh, along with names of their owners, some kind of phone book. Sometimes people will put the encryption key on their Facebook page or their personal web page. But the manner in which it's most commonly done in practice is through the public key infrastructure and digital certificates, which is something we'll see later. As far as our study of the primitive of asymmetric encryption itself goes, however, we'll assume that the sender has in its possession a trusted copy of the encryption key. When it comes to security, we will start by formalizing an extension or adaptation to this setting of the same INDCPA goal we studied for symmetric encryption. This asks that en uh, encryption hide all partial information about the data. And the novel element here compared to the symmetric setting is mainly just that the adversary needs to be given the encryption key. But then we'll also introduce an extension, indistinguishably under chosen ciphertext attack, in which privacy of the data should be maintained even in when the adversary has limited access to a decryption oracle. This is nowadays the gold standard for public key encryption. So let's uh, start with the INDCPA definition. And here we fix an asymmetric encryption scheme that's the object of security we're trying to measure. And we consider the following games, left and right, which are just as for NDCP in the symmetric setting, modulo some changes with regard to keys. Initialize will run the key generation algorithm of the scheme, which will return an encryption key and matching decryption key. And now a novel element, it will return the encryption key. This means that the adversary up front gets the encryption key as input and knows that for all the rest of its attack. The left or right oracle takes two equal length messages and then encrypts one of them. Which one will depend on the game? In the left came the left message M0, the right came the right message M1. The encryption is under the algorithm prescribed here and the key here and will could be randomized depending on the algorithm and will return a ciphertext which is given to the adversary. The adversary is allowed multiple calls to the left or right oracle, but initialize is done only once, so they all use the same encryption key. The decryption key is never used in these games. As usual, the adversary's goal is to determine which game it's playing and it will try to output a 1 when it's in game right and a 0 when it's in game left. We consider associated to the adversary the probabilities of it outputting 1 in each world. We run the adversary in the left world and there will be some probability that it outputs a 1. We then separately run the same adversary in the right world and there will be some probability that it outputs a 1. Now, the magnitudes individually of these are not of interest. What's of interest is how close they are. 
if they are close to each other, we're saying that the adversary is outputting one just about as often when it's true, meaning it is in the right world, as when it's not true, meaning when it's in the left world, which is an indication that it's not doing too well. This is captured through an advantage, which in that case would be low. The advantage is the difference in these two probabilities. The superscript is the name of the metric, subscript the scheme whose advantage we're measuring, and the argument is the adversary. Of course, the advantage depends on the adversary, on both its strategy and resources, as we've seen before. And a high advantage means the adversary is doing well and the scheme is insecure, while a low one means it's doing poorly, and at least that strategy is not showing the scheme to be insecure. This summarizes some of the things said on the prior slide, just so that there's a written record. It emphasizes the return statement in initialize, which provides the public encryption key to the adversary. In calling the left or right oracle, the adversary has to supply equal length messages. It's not allowed to call with messages of unequal length. Any adversary doing that is simply considered invalid, and its advantage is either not considered or defined or viewed as zero. When we studied symmetric encryption, we saw that it was useful for proofs to formulate the advantage of an adversary in the INDCPS sense in a different way, not through two games and as a difference in two probabilities, but through a single game. But it's useful not just in proofs, but also as perhaps even more directly capturing the intuition of trying to guess which world you're in. And it will be useful to also give that alternative formulation in the public key setting. So as before, fix our asymmetric encryption scheme and consider this single game called INDCPA associated to the scheme. It starts by picking a random bit, which we call the challenge bit. And that is to be thought of as saying left world when it's zero and right world when it's one. The key generation proceeds as before and the adversary gets the encryption key. The left or right oracle has the same syntax as before and takes two messages, but the one that's encrypted is the one indicated by the challenge bit. In other words, this is the left game when B is zero and the right game when B is one. And as usual, ciphertext goes back to the adversary. The adversary will now output a bit, which is its guess as to the value of this bit. And we evaluate whether the guess is correct, if so, returning true, and otherwise returning false. Now, if we merely consider the probability that the game returns true, it's not necessarily small. The adversary can e easily make it, for example, half by returning, say, always b prime equals 1. So we scale it to consider this quantity, which is 0, when this probability is a half. Now, this fact says that the INDCP advantage as defined earlier can also be recovered through this expression over here. And that's what we'll sometimes leverage. We're now going to strengthen the security requirement by giving the adversary also access to a decryption oracle. This decryption oracle takes a ciphertext and returns a message. It knows internally the decryption key, and thus it decrypts by simply running the decryption algorithm of the scheme. Now, it might at first feel like if the adversary has such an oracle, there's nothing we can possibly require with regard to security, but there actually is. We can still require that any ciphertext that was not explicitly decrypted through a call remains, the, remains secure in the sense that the adversary has no partial information about the underlying message. And that's the notion we'll formalize, which turns out to be important. Uh, this is now the um, definition INDCCA, as we'll call it, that's become the gold standard for public key encryption. So here are the games. We fix again our scheme, and we again have a left and right games. These games start out in their first 
procedures as being identical to the corresponding INDCPA ones. So initialize will pick the keys, return EK. The left or right oracle continues to be present and will encrypt either M0 here or M1 here. What is different here is simply some bookkeeping. A set is initialized to empty and the ciphertexts that are created in this procedure are collected in the set S. But that doesn't impact what's returned. The new element is this decryption oracle. The adversary can call it on any ciphertext of its choice and it will simply run the decryption algorithm under the decryption key generated here on that ciphertext to get a message and give that back to the adversary. Now, if we allowed that unconditionally, there would be no way to achieve security because what the adversary could do is go to the left or right oracle with two messages, get a ciphertext, query it here, get the message, and thereby know whether it got it had encrypted M0 or M1, and thereby determine whether it was in the left or right walls. To prevent that, what we do is we say here that ciphertexts in this set S are disallowed effectively. So whenever the ciphertext in the set S, the game says, no, I'm not going to decrypt. I'm just going to return bot. You're not entitled to that piece of information. And once we've done that, we've got something both non-trivial and strong. And this is what INDCP is. There's, as usual, an advantage for the adversary, which is superscript of the name of the metric, subscript the scheme, and so forth. And as usual, it's simply the difference in probabilities that it returns one in the left and right walls. So again, for to restate a few things, it's just like INDCPA, except there's this new oracle. The new oracle deck can be called on any ciphertext of the adversary's choice, except that to prevent trivial attacks, this oracle will refuse to actually decrypt for any ciphertext that had previously been returned by the left or right oracle. So having now seen uh, two definitions, we could think about how they relate. And we notice that INDCPA is effectively a special case of INDCCA. You can recover it by restricting attention to adversaries that make no queries to the decryption oracle. In particular, that means if you achieve INDCCA security, you automatically achieve INDCPA. Any scheme meeting the first also meets the second. Now, one might ask if the converse is true. Are these two equivalent? If you have a scheme that's INDCPA secure, is it guaranteed to be INDCCA secure? As you might expect, the answer is no. CCA security is strictly strong, stronger, and it's an interesting exercise to give a counterexample showing that. The way you set this up would be that you first assume you have an INDCPA scheme and then construct another one by modifying the first that maintains the INDCPA security, but for which there's a simple attack violating INDCCA security. So why INDCCA? Modern applications and usage call for that. This started getting recognized in the late 1990s with Ble Bleichenbacher's attack. And by now it's well established that the canonical and desired accepted goal for public key encryption is indeed INDCCA. You see this in standards, in new designs, and in, in everything else. Now, when we studied symmetric encryption, we gave INDCPA, but we didn't give INDCC. And one may ask what its status is there. The answer is you can define it, and we'll actually refer to it in later parts of this, uh, this study. But one reason that we didn't pay much attention to it is that there was a goal we had defined there which was already stronger, and that was authenticated encryption. Remember, authenticated encryption is a scheme that has both INDCPA and integrity of ciphertext. And one can show that the combination of those two actually implies this. So not only um, can we consider it, but due to the fact that we have schemes meeting this, we have ones meeting this already in the symmetric setting. 
Okay, so just like um, for the CPA case, we can formulate INDCC also through a single game. And for completeness and later reference, it's worth stating that. So again, we fix our scheme and consider this one game associated to it. And it performs the same type of modification as we did in the CPA case. The choice of left or right is now given by a bit actually chosen in the game. That determines whether the left or right oracle encrypts the left or right message. And that's the only change. The decryption oracle is exactly the same as in the left or right games. And as you, and you have the same bookkeeping and non-triviality checks. The adversary outputs its guess. The game returns true if the guess is correct. And the fact is that the advantage as defined before can be recaptured as twice the probability this game returns true minus one. When we looked at symmetric encryption, the ability of the adversary to make multiple queries to the left or right oracle was crucial. We can give schemes which are secure when the adversary is allowed just one query, but not when it's allowed many. Interestingly, in the public key setting, the, that's not true. So effectively, we can restrict attention to adversaries making one LR query, and this theorem captures in what way that's true. It's true for both chosen plain text and ciphertext attacks, so let's fix um, a parameter saying which attack we're considering. Take any public key encryption scheme and consider an adversary making some number Q of queries to its left or right oracle and it's trying to violate uh, security in whatever sense our parameter says here. We look at its advantage and we say that it's not more than the advantage of another attacker who is trying to attack in the same sense, it's against the same definition. The difference is it only makes a single query to its left or right oracle. And we put here, we see here its advantage but with a factor here, which is the number of queries to the left or right oracle. So now that we've seen it quantitatively, what it's saying is that, yes, you can do better with more queries, but in a limited way, your advantage can only scale linearly or as a factor of the number of queries you make. Since we can usually make this very small, this factor shouldn't make too much of a difference. So in that sense, we take away that it suffices to consider security against adversaries that make a single query to the left or oracle, which is often a nice simplification. The proof of this uses what's called a hybrid argument. We're not going to give it, but it's a nice exercise in that domain. Now, we're going to approach building public key encryption schemes by first simplifying the task a little bit and that will be done at a quite general level through something we call hybrid encryption. So what hybrid encryption does is it says give me two ingredients. The first is a primitive called a key encapsulation mechanism or CAM and the second is a symmetric encryption scheme as we understand it and have studied before. And from these two things, it will build an asymmetric encryption scheme. How does it do that? It will run the key encapsulation mechanism on input the public key. The result of that will be a symmetric key and a ciphertext encrypting it. This is done by the sender. Once the sender obtains that, it can encrypt the actual data with the symmetric key to get a ciphertext. And what's returned as the ciphertext for the asymmetric encryption scheme is the encryption of the key K together with the encryption of the data under K. The decryptor can recover this by using the decryption key from the key encapsulation mechanism to get K and then symmetrically decrypt this over here. There's a number of reasons this is preferred. One is that CAMs are simpler than public key encryption. There's no message to deal with. And 
The other is that since public key operations are slow, this ends up being a performance improvement. So um, we will spend now a little bit of time developing this method or paradigm before we come to designing the CAMs in order to then get PKE. So we now have this new primitive, a CAM or key encapsulation mechanism. So let's go through definitions of that. And we start as usual with syntax. So a CAM scheme or CAM is a triple of algorithms, key generation, encryption, and decryption. The last K is just there to kind of um, indicate that we are talking about a CAM. And also associated to this um, triple of algorithms is an integer k called the key length, which will be the length of what we call the key k earlier. So how do the op algorithms operate? You generate keys just like an asymmetric encryption. This algorithm will give you an encryption key and a decryption key. When you want to encrypt, however, the difference is that there's no message. This algorithm will take no inputs other than the encryption key and will spit out not just a ciphertext, but two things, the other being a symmetric key k. That's just a string whose length is this parameter over here. Effectively, this is the message. So you have a situation where the algorithm is itself generating the message in some way, and then also giving you a ciphertext encrypting that message. But the message is mandated to be a key in this range. When you decrypt, you have as input the ciphertext here, and you have the decryption key, and you get back um, a candidate value for k here. So it's a value k prime, and it will be either a string or again, it's okay if it rejects. So now what is the correct decryption requirement? It's that for all choices of key, these two will be the same. So in other words, when you encrypt and get this pair, the ciphertext and symmetric key, then you decrypt the ciphertext, you get back a key, and they're required to match up with probability one. So this allows us to create and communicate symmetric keys and that's how it's going to be exploited to build public key encryption. So we'll see later how to build them. For the moment, we're going to study them and, and um, study hybrid encryption in terms of them. So what is the security requirement for key encapsulation mechanisms? So let's consider such a mechanism and with K it's key length. And let's say we ran it uh, we ran encapsulation or encryption with some encryption key. And what we got back, remember, is not just one thing, but two. There's a symmetric key and a ciphertext that encrypts it. Our requirement is that this key should look random. In other words, if an adversary is only given the ciphertext, it somehow cannot distinguish this key from a random string. And here's how we'll formally capture that. Consider an adversary who gets the public key, who also gets the ciphertext from here. And then here it gets one of two things. Either it gets k1, or it gets a random string k0 of the same length as k1, the choice of which is made by this challenge bit, uh, b chosen over here. And the adversary's job is to figure out what b is. So security will require that this adversary has a hard time succeeding at that. It has a low advantage. Right? So again, intuitively, what this tells us is even if you know the ciphertext, this key looks random to the extent that you cannot even tell whether I gave you that key or an independent random string. And why this? Intuitively, because if this is true, it's fine to use k1 as a key for symmetric encryption and you can do that securely. Let's now formalize that using games. We'll again have both INDCP and INDCC definitions and again in the left or right and single game styles. 
So a lot of definitions, but it's following the templates we saw earlier. And so hopefully it'll be manageable. So we fix a chem with a certain key length and we consider these gains left or right. In initialize, we run key generation to get our encryption and decryption keys. As usual, the adversary gets the encryption key. In the procedure here, we call it enc. It's no longer left or right because there aren't two messages to be encrypted. In fact, there are no messages at all in chems. So enc takes no inputs. What it does is it runs the encryption algorithm with input the encryption key, and that returns a symmetric key K1 and a ciphertext that encrypts K1. Additionally, the oracle picks a random K0, which is a K-bit key. That happens in both games. The difference in the two games is what gets returned. A pair of things gets returned here, the first element of the pair is k0, here it's k1. In both cases, the same ciphertext here gets returned. So this is the only difference. Now, in this case, we, the key k1 is what you would get if you decrypted c sub a. In this case, it's not. If you decrypted c sub a, you would not get k1. You would get, you would get not get k0, but rather would get k1. However, the intent is that the adversary should not be able to tell that or to know which of those happens because it's not able to perform these decryptions. So as usual, you define the INDCP advantage of the adversary as the difference in the probabilities that it outputs one in the right and left worlds. It has the same notation as before in the sense that the superscript is still INDCPA but ambiguity shouldn't be created as to which we're referring to because the subscript will disambiguate. You can tell that it's either an asymmetric encryption scheme or a chem and thereby know which definition we're speaking about. Here's the rendition of the same thing with a single game, just called INDCPA, but now subscripted with a chem instead of an asymmetric encryption scheme. What does it do? In initialize, the choice of which game, left or right, is made at random and captured in this challenge bit B. Keys generated as usual, adversary gets encryption key. The enc oracle, as before, picks a random K0 and generates K1 and the ciphertext encrypting it by running the encryption algorithm on input the encryption key. It then returns always the ciphertext, but which key? changes depending on this challenge bit. The adversary's job is to guess the challenge bit and to do that it outputs a bit fi b prime which goes to finalize and finalize returns true if the guess is correct and false otherwise. As usual the fact here says consider the adv INDCP advantage as defined earlier you can rewrite it in this way with reference to the game we're looking at now. So, and again, as usual, we'll find this useful in analyses. Now, also for chems, in parallel with asymmetric encryption, we can consider chosen ciphertext attacks. So let's go ahead and give some security games for that. So we go back to having left and right games, and their first parts, the initialize procedure and ink procedure, are the same as before. So keys are generated here, encryption key returned, enc takes no inputs, it picks a random key and, and also generates through the encryption algorithm k1 and the ciphertext encrypting it and it returns here k0 and here k1 and also in both cases the ciphertext. The differences are simply bookkeeping with regard to these sets but they don't impact what's returned. The new element is the decryption procedure. This oracle will take any ciphertext of the adversary's choice and will decrypt it under the decryption key and return the result to the adversary. And this result now is viewed as a symmetric key. As before, we have to exclude trivial attacks. So if the ciphertext falls in this set S, 
meaning had been earlier returned by the encryption oracle, then the decryption oracle says, no, I don't agree to decrypt that, and I'm just going to return a bot. And that oracle works exactly the same in both cases. So now we have an INDCC advantage, which is the probability that the adversary returns right one in the right world minus the probability returns one in the left world. And as before also, we can now cast that in the single game form, and this does that. So all the themes are the same. Uh, we can just briefly see what's happening is your challenge bit here is indicating whether you do the left or right world choice of the prior games. Finalize will take this bit returned by the adversary and return true uh, if it matches the challenge bit and false otherwise. And the fact says that if you look at this expression, you recover the same INDCC advantage as before. Okay, so, so far what we've done, we've seen a lot of definitions, so maybe it'll help to organize them a little bit. So we have considered, first of all, multiple syntaxes. One is the syntax of public key encryption. That's a certain type of scheme with certain types of algorithms. CHEMs are a different primitive or a different syntax, very closely related, but not identical. And looking farther back, we also had symmetric encryption, which was yet another syntax. For any of these, we could consider the INDCPA security definition, and for each it has a, def a particular formulation using games. And we could also, for any of them, consider INDCC. So there are two uh, different definitions. Additionally, each of these can be cast in two forms, the left or right games form or the single game alternative form. So if you think about it that way, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then times two, 12 definitions but they're quite um, related to each other and they're organized along quite structured lines and hopefully that'll help in keeping them apart and in particular this picture would, would help for that. Remember that no matter what CCA security is stronger, INDCC always implies um, INDCPA, as it's a typo there, meaning any scheme meeting this also meets INDCPA. Replicating or an analogy again to what we said for public key encryption, also for key encapsulation mechanisms, we can, without loss of generality, restrict attention to adversaries making just one query to the ink oracle. This is useful in proofs because more queries to the ink oracle creates more technical difficulties in doing those proofs. And again, the formal result says that you can change the advantage only by a factor of the number of ENC queries. So formally, for both chosen plaintext and chosen ciphertext attack, if you fix some key encapsulation method with a certain key length, and you consider an adversary making Q queries to the encryption oracle, then its advantage is no more than Q times the advantage of an adversary making only one query to the ENC oracle. The number of decryption queries of A and A1 is the same. To be clear, in the CCA case, we have reduced the number of encryption queries from Q to 1, but we did not change the number of decryption queries. And again, we don't give the proof, which is a nice exercise in, in hybrid arguments. Okay, so at this point, we've defined key encapsulation mechanisms. And so we can come back and precisely state how hybrid encryption works. Recall hybrid encryption was a way to build public key encryption schemes from chems and symmetric encryption with the purpose of simplification and performance improvement. So now let's say I'm given a chem with a certain key length. The symmetric encryption scheme I'm given has to match up in the sense that its keys have to be random k-bit keys so that the keys created by the chem can play their role. Hybrid encryption associates to these two ingredients a public key encryption scheme. So here we return to the public key encryption syntax 
And to tell you how this scheme works, I have to tell you it's key ge generation, encryption, and decryption algorithms. The key generation algorithm of the public key encryption scheme is the same as that of the CAM. So it's just K equals this algorithm over here. In detail, it just you can write it as running this and returning the same pairs of keys that it got here. Now we describe the encryption algorithm. It takes input the encryption key. This being public key encryption, there is a message, unlike for chems. So what does it do? First, it ignores the message and runs the encryption algorithm of the chem on input the encryption key to get back a symmetric key K and the ciphertext that encrypts that key. Now with this key, it can run the symmetric encryption scheme encryption algorithm now involving the message. And that gives it back uh, another ciphertext. The subscripts are to denote that this is a, the symmetric part of the ciphertext and the A indicates that this is the asymmetric part of the ciphertext. And the pair is returned as the ciphertext for the asymmetric encryption scheme. Okay, what about decryption? The decryption algorithm gets this entire pair as the ciphertext and it has access to the decryption key. The first thing it does is it applies the chem decryption algorithm with the decryption key to the asymmetric part of the ciphertext. We know by the correctness of the chem that what that will do is it will recover the key K here. So now that that's recovered, you can run the decryption algorithm of the symmetric scheme with that key and the symmetric ciphertext as input and you will get back the message. Okay, and then that's returned. Now, one thing to beware of here is that in decryption, steps may fail. So, for example, the decryption algorithm here could return bot. And similarly here. So, we adopt the convention that whenever something is bot and that something is an input to an algorithm, the algorithm's output is automatically bot. So, if K is bot, then M will automatically be bought since K appears here. It could be that K is not bought and this algorithm produces an M that's bought. Uh, so in either case, there are lots of ways of getting this uh, output over here. So this theorem says that hybrid encryption works. What does that mean? If the ingredients, the key encapsulation method and the symmetric encryption scheme are both secure, then the public key encryption scheme constructed by hybrid encryption is itself secure. What do we mean by secure? Well, we've explored two ideas, INDCPA and DCCA, and the theorem is true for both. Now, there's a fair amount going on there in the sense that the IND ATK, where ATK is either CPA or CCA, is going to be assumed for both the CHEM and the symmetric encryption scheme and transferred to the public key encryption scheme. So here we have the quantitative and more formal rendering of the result. So we fix our key encapsulation mechanism and we let K be its key length. We also need a symmetric encryption scheme it has to be compatible in the sense that the keys returned by its key generation algorithm are random uh, strings of length, this key length over here. Now, we build a public key encryption scheme. How do we do that? We do it by the specific hybrid encryption method that we used, uh, defined on the prior slides. And now we want to discuss the security of the scheme over here. We parameterize the result by the choice of attack, chosen plain text or chosen ciphertext, because it applies to both. Now we take an adversary that's attacking the public key encryption scheme in the IND ATK sense. So it has access to a left or right oracle and makes some number of queries to it. And at the end, it achieves some advantage that we have over here. And we're trying to say that this advantage is relatively small as a function of some advantages associated to other adversaries we construct attacking our ingredients. 
The theorem accordingly gives us a pair of address trees, B asymmetric and B symmetric. B asymmetric attacks the key encapsulation mechanism, and this B symmetric attacks the symmetric encryption scheme. So you look at those advantages, and then you, you scale this up by a factor of two, this by a stack factor of the number of LR queries here. And that becomes a bound on how well this does. As usual, think of this and this as small, which tells us this is small, and that's how we conclude qualitatively that the INDATK security of both the CHEM and the symmetric encryption scheme imply that of the public key encryption scheme. So next we look at resources. Uh, we said that this algorithm A makes Q sub B left or right queries. In the CCA case, there are also some number of decryption queries. So this algorithm needs to make ENC queries, and the number of those will be the same as the number of left or right queries made by A. This B S, the symmetric algorithm, will need to make queries to its left or right oracle. Here, interestingly, the number of these queries is one. It doesn't depend on this over here, which instead shows up as a factor outside. That's for the CPA case and the CCA case, but in the CCA case, additionally, we need to talk about decryption queries, which are made by all three of the algorithms shown here, and they're all three the same in number. So in other words, these constructed algorithms may just make the same number of deck queries as A and running times are roughly maintained. So this theorem may need a bit of parsing in particular because two primitives are being used and the security of both is simultaneously invoked to establish security of the one we're building. But once we have this theorem and, and the proof that we'll give, at least for a special case, will hopefully elucidate uh, why. Um, it'll be quite useful in later simplifications. So we've alluded before to the benefits, but let's uh, state them in a little more detail here. One of them is modular design. What that means is consider that we will have many choices of each component, many choices of symmetric encryption schemes, many choices of CAMs, and then we can glue them together as we want to result uh, in as many public key schemes as that will um, allow for um, message encryption. The second nice thing is that we have broken a complex problem, public key encryption, into simpler parts, but in a way that has proof-based assurance. So we know that this method itself works, and so we are reduced to the hopefully simpler task of building the primitives. Now, on the side of speed, block ciphers and hash functions, are, which are the building blocks for symmetric cryptography, are much faster than number theory, the operations used for asymmetric cryptography. The factor can range depending on the platforms, software, hardware, uh, implementations, and so forth. And performance numbers can be found on the internet for a wide variety of these, these platforms to see what the kinds of ranges are. When we use a chem, what we've done is we've limited the number theoretic operations to an amount that doesn't depend on the length of the message, because the chem is not aware of the message. So it, it only performs a fixed amount of work, regardless of how much data you're encrypting. And this um, yields a performance improvement. Okay, so now let's um, try to see if we can understand why the hybrid encryption theorem, saying hybrid encryption works, is actually true. To do this, we're first going to consider some simplifications. So while the theorem holds for both CPA and CCA, this proof sketch and ensuing proof will only be for CPA. Secondly, while the adversary there makes some number Q sub B of and queries to its LR oracle, that's a parameter, I'm just going to assume it's one. Uh, we've actually seen that that's without loss of generality. Um, and 
So we'll move with that. When we made those simplifications, let's consider what's happening in the games that our public key encryption algorithm adversary A is playing, meaning the INDCPA game or the left or right games, whichever way you want. We'll look at it for um, public key encryption. So in particular, I will actually use the alternative formulation. So it's the single game formulation. And we'll let B be the challenge bit chosen there. So our adversary A is going to supply a pair of messages, M0, M1 to LR, and M sub B will be encrypted. And we know that the encryption is done in this hybrid form. So the ciphertext that gets back is the asymmetric ciphertext and the symmetric one. The asymmetric ciphertext and a key which is encapsulated by that ciphertext are created through the chem. And the symmetric ciphertext here under K1 encrypts whichever message the game decides to choose. So this, which we'll call the challenge ciphertext, is what the left or right oracle returns to our adversary A in the def definition. And its task is to compute the challenge bit B. We are interested in saying that the, 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 this probability of the, the advantage in this case is not too big. Now we're going to consider another game, calling the first one G1, we'll call this G0. And what we do is we switch the key used in the symmetric encryption from K1 to an independent random string K0. And everything else stays the same. Now we consider these two games together and make the following observations. First off, in game G0, the adversary's task in determining the challenge bit B comes down just to breaking symmetric encryption. C sub A is now irrelevant. Why? All it does is encapsulate K1, and K1 isn't even used here. The adversary is aware that it's in game G0, and it knows that here some random key has been used to encrypt either M0 or M1. So it's effectively attacking the symmetric encryption scheme, but we assume the latter is good, so we don't expect it to win over here. What about G1? Well, what we're going to do is say that the chance that it wins G1 is not too different from the chance it wins G0. Why is that? Because that would correspond to breaking the chem. You see that the only difference between this and this is that K1 is switched to K0. And the chem security says that in the presence of C sub A, an adversary can't really tell whether it's handed K1 or K0. And that will allow us to say that there, these, um, the probably that adversary wins is kind of the same in these two. Okay, so if you follow that intuition, it's um, maybe relatively simple to set up games, but we'll try to do this. Remembering again, we are only considering chosen plain text attacks and one query to LR. Here's how we set up games. So what is our starting point? It's the INDCPA game for A, meaning for public key encryption. So one could go back and look at that game. And if you remember, initialize picks a challenge bit, generates keys according to the public key encryption scheme. But here, that's the same as the keys for the chem and returns to the adversary the encryption key. The game must also export a left or right oracle, which takes M0 and M1 and produce an, an encryption of the message M sub B. And finalize takes what the adversary returns, a bit B prime, returns true of B equals B prime and false otherwise. Now, we will consider games G0 and G1. So D will indicate whether it's 0 or 1. So let's start with G1. The bit D is used in only one place here. So now if you look at G1, this is a symmetric encryption under the key K1 picked over here and K0 is ignored. The result is that it completely matches the INDCPA game. 
And we know by definition that the advantage of A in the INDCPA game is twice the probability that the INDCPA game returns true minus one. That was a fact we had earlier about the one game formulation. So we have this equation relating game G1 to the advantage we're interested in. Now we do a trivial step. I throw in the probability of G0 with A returning true here and subtract it here. So clearly it makes no difference. And I simplify. Okay. And um, I then simplify again and I write it like this. Two times the difference in these two probabilities plus this, which is effectively the adversary's advantage in game G0. Okay. Now what is game G0? We said here that this bit D is used in one place. So that simply means that in G0, this is K0. So in G0, this key is being used for the symmetric part and K1 is ignored. So now, as per our intuition, this can be bounded by chem security and this by the security of the symmetric encryption scheme. So let's go ahead and do that. So here's our chem adversary. Okay. So backing up a bit, what does our chem adversary need to do? It is playing the INDCPA game or left or right games. It doesn't matter here. We'll actually use left or right for, um, for chems. And that means it has access to an ENC oracle and it will be making one query to that. That ENC oracle will give it back a challenge key K and a ciphertext. And it needs to decide is K the key that's obtained by decrypting this or is it just some random string? And it asks itself, how am I going to figure that out? It will get help from our public key encryption algorithm adversary A. So it needs to run A. What does A need to run? First off, it needs the public key. But our chem adversary had that as input from its game, and it can supply it to A also as input. A also needs access to a left or right oracle, so our chem adversary will have to simulate that. So that oracle takes two messages, and the job of B is to encrypt one of them. So. Now, how um, is our adversary B going to proceed? What it's going to do is say, A is trying to figure out whether it's getting the left or right message encrypted. And I'm going to see how good it is at figuring that out. So I'm going to pick my own challenge bit here. And then I'm going to use it over here. And now here we see a typo that M sub B should actually be M sub C where C is this bit over here, okay? Now A will return a guess, a guess as to what the value of the challenge bit, which from its point of view is C. And our adversary B will test, did you get it right? And if so, it'll say, I think we were looking at the real key K and otherwise at the random key. Okay. And where does that key K enter? It's what's used for symmetric encryption in here. That's the key under which M sub B is encrypted. Okay. So now, to understand this, consider the execution of this adversary B in the left and right worlds. So it's a chem adversary. We play it in the right game. What does that mean? It means that the key K here is real. It's K1. It's the one that is encrypted by this. And that same key would now appear here. That means that this message M sub C is being encrypted exactly as in game G1. So in game G1, that game would return true when C equals C prime. Right? So that here corresponds to this adversary returning one. So the probability B sub A returns one is the probability that G1 returns true. Correspondingly, the probability that B A returns one in the left game is the probability that G0 with A returns true. Why is that? Because in the left game, K is K0. It's the random key. And that will appear over here. 
And now if you pattern match with G0, you see that that's exactly what G0 also provides. Okay. Now, all of this takes work. You have to slowly go through these steps and check all of it. And remember that this little b should be a c and, um, and see that it all works out. Once you do that, though, you see that you can obtain the advantage by definition of BA as the difference between these two, which hence is the difference between these two. And that was the first term on the prior slide. So we've now bounded that first term. So that's progress. We now need to bound the second term. The second term pertains only to G0. And it's, and it's this over here. And we're going to say that we can build a symmetric encryption adversary whose advantage is this over here. How do we do that? The symmetric encryption adversary, remember, itself has access to a left or right oracle. We have to go back to the games in our symmetric encryption chapter to remember that that oracle is encrypting symmetrically under a key that's hidden inside the game being played there. So in that INDCPA game, what does this adversary do? It says, I need to call my left or right oracle, and I need to somehow, from the result, determine whether I'm in the left or right world. So it's going to run our public key encryption algorithm uh, adversary A to help it. But that adversary, the first thing it needs is a public key. So where is our symmetric algorithm going to get that from? Simple, it just itself runs key generation for the chem to not only get a public encryption key, but even get the decryption key, which it won't use here. It then runs A with the encryption key, and A will ask for a left or right oracle, which B sub S will simulate. How does B sub S simulate it? Well, when it gets the two messages M0 and M1, it will proceed to return an appropriate hybrid encryption. So for that, it has to run the chem encapsulation mechanism on input the encryption key to get back a symmetric key K1 and the ciphertext that encapsulates it. Then it'll go to its own left or right oracle and obtain a symmetric encryption. That symmetric encryption is under what key? Under a key that's hidden inside this oracle and which we are going to think of as K0. So from our point of view, this is created as an encryption under K0 of M sub B, where B is the challenge bit in the game played by B sub S. And now the ciphertext returned back to A in response to its LR query has this asymmetric component and this symmetric one. So notice K1 was never used. And instead, K0 was implicitly used through this oracle. A will eventually output a guess saying, I think this is the world I'm in. And exactly the same one will be returned by B sub S, indeed, because the LR queries here are in correspondence. And the analysis or the explanations show that this um, relationship is true. Okay, so that's it. So we have a justification, but we haven't um, proven the theorem in full generality. So um, the exercise here is to do that. It says give a proof saying uh, that hybrid encryption indeed works when the number of LR queries of A is not merely one, but is Q sub A, and where the chosen ciphertext attacks enters, so a decryption oracle is indeed available. Okay, so here's where we are. We now know how to achieve public key encryption schemes with IND ATK security, ATK being either CPA or CCA. And the method is, I need a chem and a symmetric encryption schemes for the same notion, somewhat simpler objects individually. 
how are we going to get them? Well, the symmetric encryption scheme is easy. We've already studied that and we have plenty of choices. For the INDCPA case, there would be the standard modes of operation like counter or CBC for a good block cipher. For the INDCCA case, we can use any scheme that achieves INDCPA plus integrity of ciphertext, meaning any authenticated encryption scheme. So we could build it out of Encrypt and Mac, or we could use the OCB or GCM schemes. In fact, there are simpler choices than these possible because the symmetric adversary B sub S in our hybrid encryption theorem made only one query to its left or right oracle. So in particular, even deterministically encrypting schemes will, um, will work. But um, so that part of the ingredient list is easy. But what about the first part? We, we don't yet have any key encapsulation mechanisms. So this is what we're going to do next. We're going to turn to building those using number theory. And towards that, well, we have two main sources of hard problems in number theory, discrete log and RSA. And so we'll, we'll go through each and we'll build a chem uh, for each of them in turn. Now, one of the ingredients we'll want and use in the design of these chems will be hash functions. So things that are keyless and public, just like SHA-256, except that the output lengths can vary and the choices of these output lengths will be different depending on the chems. We may need often just one such function, but sometimes more. So we let n be the number we need. Common choices are just n equals one or two. In practice, we'll build them from cryptographic hash functions like SHA-256, and we'll discuss a little bit more how in detail in a bit. When we prove security of the chems, however, we'll use the random oracle model. And in those, these hash functions are modeled as independent random functions, and they are formalized as procedures which are added to all the games we consider. And access to these procedures is provided to other game oracles and thus to scheme algorithms and also to the adversary. And that's why we often refer to them uh, due to this oracle access feature as random oracles. So let's first consider the sort of concrete practical choices we might make so we're seeking hash functions, some number n of them say, which map strings of arbitrary length to strings of length L sub i, where L sub i is a given parameter. Now, there is a function called shake256, which is what's called an extended output function. That means that you can give it a normal input but you can also give it another input, which is an integer, and it will return as many output bits as that integer indicates. So this leads to a simple design for our functions. For example, just set h, say, h sub i of x to be shaked to 256 applied to x, and with the output length saying, please give me l sub i bits of output. Now, additionally, we put into the input some encoding of the index i, for example, as a one byte string. Why do we do that? Because we want the h sub i functions to be effectively independent of each other. And the understanding is that's kind of what we'll get by making the input uh, depend on i in this way. Another way to define h sub i through more conventional hash functions like SAW256 is as follows. So we need some number L sub i of bits as output. We want to use SHA-256. The difficulty is that that will only give us 256 bits of output and we may need more or potentially less. So what we do is we evaluate SHA-256 on a sequence of inputs which are related to each other but different and all involve x. And when we get enough bits, 
that we have else sabai, we stop and we output the first tell sabai. Right? So in particular, more detail, we apply SHA-256 to 0, i and x. So these are one byte encodings. Then to 1, i and x and, to, and so on. Up to, well, as mentioned, you can fit into a byte. And again, we include i, the index here, so as to make sure that all the functions are different. And of course, there will be some limits on the output length, but that's just due to using one byte encodings. If we want more bits, which we rarely do, we can change the encoding method. Now, the way to think about these functions moving forward is that they behave like independent random functions. And intuitively, that's what happens. But this is not a formal claim. What the corresponding formal claims will start emerging when we get to the random oracle model in which the proofs of security are given. But for an understanding of the schemes, it's, it's useful to just have these concrete instantiations in mind. OK, so now we start turning back to all our number theory. Remember, our goal is key encapsulation mechanisms. I want to design a chem. And let's start by first looking at the discrete log problem as a possible source for it. So that means we want to somehow set things up so that adversaries are forced to solve the discrete log problem to violate security. So let's fix a cyclic group with a generator little g. There are many choices, elliptic curve groups, groups of integers, mod or prime, and so forth. And assume the discrete log problem there is hard. And I'm trying to design a key encapsulation mechanism. And let's shoot for INDCPA security at the moment. But we want that that follows from the assumed hardness of the discrete log. So how could we try to make that happen? Suppose we do the following. We let the encryption key just be the group generator G. How will I encapsulate or how do I create the chem encryption mechanism? Well, it takes this key G and it has to return a symmetric key and something that encrypts it. For the symmetric key, it returns a random point in Zm, where m is the order of the group, so effectively a random exponent. And it encrypts little x by raising g to the power little x to get big X, and that functions as the asymmetric cipher text. So why would we want to do this? Well, we know that going from big X to little x is hard. That's solving the discrete log problem. And so an adversary trying to violate INDCPA security of the chem would be hopefully at least faced with solving the discrete log problem and it can't do that so maybe this is looking like something secure so does something like that work well a little thought shows no that there's a fundamental problem with this which is that there's no decryption capability so the adversary would find it hard to go from big x to little x but we want the decryptor to find it easy to go from big X to little x based on its secret decryption key. But here, there seems to be no way to have that happen. In particular, we don't know of no key that we can provide the decryptor that would make that task easy. And so we haven't actually got a, a working chem this way. In fact, the lesson from that is that it's it's quite hard to directly use the discrete log problem in an encryption setting. And instead, what we do is we recall the Diffie-Hellman secret key exchange and the corresponding computational Diffie-Hellman problem, and that's what we're going to be able to exploit. So we continue to fix a cyclic group of order m, and here we just recall the way the key exchange worked. Alice picks a random exponent and raises g to that power to get big x and transmits big x. Bob likewise picks a random exponent little y, raises g to the power little y to get big y, transmits big y. And the shared secret key is g to the power little x little y. And each of them can compute it through these two different algebraic formulas. You can either raise big y to the little x or big x to the little y. And so the keys are the same. But the adversary only has g to the little x and g to the little y. 
and going from those to this quantity here is the computational diffie hellman problem which we believe is hard okay so we have that and our claim is that based on that i can quite easily get a key encapsulation mechanism so we're going to describe that and the idea is simply that alice's big x is the public key and her little x is the secret key and the big y is picked by bob so i'm going to call this chem cdh to indicate that it's a chem and it's based on cdh with the subscript indicating that i'm targeting indcpa security here because we'll also have a cca version so we fix our cyclic group of order m the generator and group order and the group are all public and now we start using these hash functions we discussed earlier so in this case i'll want one of them and its output length which we call k is going to be this key length of the chem remember that a chem has an associated number called the key length which is the length of the key that it encrypts how do our algorithms work key generation is going to produce a secret key a random exponent and as public key g to that power we know that going from the public key to secret key is hard which is a sanity check for security when i want to encrypt i get the public key and now i'm going to write the hash function here as a superscript just to indicate that it's going to be called as an oracle that is something that will somehow help us at least notationally and conceptually transition later to thinking of it as a random oracle but for the moment it just indicates a subroutine being called how does uh, that encryption process work it plays the role of bob in the key exchange it picks a random exponent little y raises g to that power to get big y and creates the diffie hellman key the diffie hellman key is big x to the little y and we know that that equals g to the power little x little y by the math we saw earlier now the symmetric key that the chem creates is not quite z but it's closely related it hashes z down to a k bit string and that's the key returned here the ciphertext encapsulating it is this g to the little y in the input of the hash function we also throw in the 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 y for um, various reasons that we don't have to worry about for the moment now how do we perform decryption the decryptor has the secret key so that's a little x in the subscript here and it also has oracle access to our hash function and what it gets is this cipher text y over here and its job is to recover this k over here it first does the diffie hellman part so we know that this z can be recovered by raising this y to the power of the secret key little x and again that's g to the power of little x little y but once you have that of course the same formula as here enables you to recover k and return that all right so um now one thing that sometimes creates some confusion is worth clarifying is that the way the scheme is written here is for a general group and hence group operations are written generically if you were to implement this or instantiate this in a specific group you would have to use the group operations given by that group so for example if you work in the group of integers mod a prime p then you know that the order of the group is p minus one and any time above in the description we see some b raised to some w you implement it as the modular x power algorithm applied to b w and p in other words it's happening mod p and eventually our claim is going to be that this scheme is achieving indcpa security as a chem in the random oracle model so that's a that's a quite neat little construct and if you put that together with hybrid encryption we now have indcpa secure public key encryption next let's look at what would take to get a chem that's cca secure so that we can get 
uh, public key encryption that's signed DCC is secure. And we're going to extend the prior design. And this time we'll use two of these hash functions. The first one plays the role of the prior hash function and it returns k bits and k again will become the key length of the cam. And the second returns outputs of length another parameter l which will impact security. So now we define the cam by giving its algorithms. The key generation is the same as before. So the secret key is a exponent chosen at random. Public key is g to that power. Encapsulation, given the public key and access to the two hash functions, starts the same way as before. You, like Bob in the secret key exchange, pick a random exponent little y, raise g to the power to get big Y, and compute the Diffie-Hellman key, which is the public key big X, raised to the power little y, which is g to the little xy. And you derive, just as before, the symmetric key k, with h1 playing the role of h. That same symmetric key continues to be the one provided here as output. The y, as before, goes in the ciphertext. So what's the new element? The ciphertext also includes a tag. And what is that tag? It's just the other hash function also applied to the same inputs as here, to y and most importantly, to the Diffie-Hellman key. So you think of that tag as kind of a proof that the person supplying a ciphertext knows the Diffie-Hellman key. And that's going to help us achieve security against chosen ciphertext attack. How does the tag influence what happens in decryption where well, it's verified? So in decryption, you have the secret key little x and access to the two hash functions. The ciphertext you get is this pair over here. You first recover the Diffie-Hellman key by raising this y to the secret key little x. And you recover the symmetric key k by hashing y and z with the first hash function. Now in the prior chem, we would simply output this. But here, you first pause and check the tag. So you evaluate h2 as here. And you see whether it matches the tag supplied over here. If they match, then you return k. But if they don't, you reject. And our claim about this will be INDCCA security in the ROM. And again, putting that together with hybrid encryption, we now have a INDCCA uh, PKE scheme. Good, so that's a uh, few schemes. Now, um, discrete log is one of the choices for a number theoretic basis for public key cryptography. And remember, we studied two. The other one was the RSA system. So let's try also to get um, uh, chems based on the RSA system. So uh, we're going to start by kind of getting some intuition about it. And RSA has the nice feature that it lends itself to encryption much more naturally than the discrete log problem where we had to move to CDH because it already provides a way to effectively encrypt and decrypt. And we're going to formalize that as what we'll call the plain RSA scheme. This is actually a public key encryption scheme. It's not a CAN. It actually encrypts a message. The scheme is associated to an RSA generator. Remember, an RSA generator is something that sets everything up. If you run it, you get the modulus, the primes P and Q, such that N is P times Q, and the encryption and decryption exponents. And schemes and security are relative to some generator. So the plain RSA public key encryption scheme algorithms look like this. The key generation algorithm runs the generator to get these five things. The public key is the modulus and encryption exponent. Secret key is the modulus and decryption exponent. Now, of course, the modulus isn't really secret, but conceptually, um, the pair is the secret key. The really secret quantity from a security perspective is the decryption exponent D. How do I encrypt a message M under the public key? I just raise M to the eth power mod M. Now, for that to make sense, I need that messages are in Zn star. 
So let's assume that. Uh, of course, they might be given as strings uh, of some fixed length, but we view them as encoding or representing numbers in Z and star. So I raise m to the e mod n, and that's my ciphertext, and that's it. How do I decrypt? Well, RSA tells me exactly what to do. If I take the ciphertext and raise to the dth power, the d is in the secret key, I know by RSA properties that I'll get back the message. So decryption correctness indeed holds. All right, so we see here that there's a very natural candidate, and indeed this is how encryption wasn't proposed to be done when RSA was first invented. From our modern perspective, however, we would we kind of quickly see that security-wise, we would have some concerns about plain RSA. Right? So certainly it's true that going from the public key to the secret key is a hard operation. That would involve factoring the modulus, as we studied when we studied RSA. And that's kind of the basis for the very first historical classical rudimentary takes on security. You need to make sure that key recovery, here recovery, the secret key is, is made difficult. But INDCPA asks for much more than that. And here we see that encryption is deterministic and no deterministic scheme can achieve INDCPA security. For example, it'll, when the scheme is deterministic, you can tell whether the same message has been encrypted twice or two different messages have been encrypted when you see the ciphertext and that violates INDCPA. So this isn't going to work. Now as a little exercise, you could formalize the last claim. So actually give a pseudocode described adversary violating INDCPA of plain RSA encryption uh, using one left or right query. Okay. okay. So we want to get around this, and now we're going to go back actually to building key encapsulation mechanisms. This one is called Chem RSA, and it's the CPA version of it. We again fix our RSA generator, and we're going to use again a hash function with k bit output, and again k is going to be the length of the key that's encapsulated under the Chem. How does it work? Key generation is just as before. Run the generator to get your parameters, Modulus and encryption exponent is the public key, and modulus decryption exponent the secret key. When I want to encrypt a key with under public key NE and with Oracle access to the hash function, here's what I do. I first pick a random point in Zn star. And now I raise that to the eth power mod n. That effectively is my ciphertext y. So you can think of it as encrypting little y. Effectively, there's no message, remember, in a chem. At some level, little y functions as a randomly chosen message. What is the symmetric key? It's the hash of y, not y itself, but it's hash. And that goes into the output over here. Decryption needs to recover this key k given y oracle access to h and the secret key. The main step is to reverse RSA. If I take this y and raise to the dth power, I know by the RSA properties that I'll recover this little y, because I'll get this little y to the ed, and that gives me back the little y. Once I have that, of course, it's easy to hash. The hash function is a public oracle available here, and you get back the k, and you can return it. Okay, and our claim about this will be INDCPA security in the wrong. So now we have a way to get RSA-based encryption. Here's the CCA version of the scheme. So in this one, we have two hash functions. The first one, H1, plays the same role as the hash function in the prior scheme. And again, its output length K is going to be the length of the key in the chem. The second hash function outputs strings of some length L, a parameter which influences security. And the algorithms are as follows, and they use effectively the same idea as we saw in turning the 
CDH CPA chem into a CCA one, which is that you add a tag. So keys are as before, public key here, secret key here. How does encapsulation work? First, as before, you pick a random Y from Z and star and create your symmetric uh, encapsulated key by hashing Y. H1 plays the role of the prior H. The Y goes in the ciphertext, the, this K becomes the key. And additionally, there's a tag, which is simply the other hash function applied to the same Y. Again, it functions effectively as a kind of proof that if you can create a ciphertext that decrypts to non-bot, you must know what little y is because you managed to compute its hash. How does decryption work? Access to the two hash functions and it has the secret key and the ciphertext is this pair. First RSA, it raises this to the dth power, gets back little y, and now it can recover the key, the symmetric key. However, rather than outputting that, it checks the tag first. So you evaluate the second hash function on the same little y. If you did get the tag, you return the key and otherwise you return bot. And here our claim will be CCA security in the ROM. All right, so we now have numerous candidate schemes, two under CDH, two under RSA, and as we are claiming here, they have some security properties in the random oracle model. And so our next step is going to be to justify that. And that'll involve introducing this random oracle model and then stating and proving theorems about the security of these chems.